thank you all so much for joining us. We're so thrilled that you're here um, to talk about something that is really um, near and dear to Andrea and to my heart, um, which is best practices for global pay reporting. And I think that Andrea and I spend just a tremendous amount of our time um, working with employers, um, talking about global pay reporting, and it feels like it's this area that is just rapidly, rapidly expanding. So we wanted to talk a little bit um, about, about that this process. But first, I wanted to do a little bit of housekeeping. Um, first of all, Cindio is not a law firm. So while I am a lawyer, um, I'm not your lawyer, and we can't um, provide legal advice. So we always um, recommend that you consult counsel um, on how to ensure compliance and in all of the information that we're talking about today and the content and the toolkits that we're providing are for general informational purposes only. Second, if you can use the, key, the Q and A or the chat features um, to submit questions, we'll make sure to answer them at the end of our session today. Um, one note is if you submit those anonymously through the Q and A por portion and we aren't able to get to them by the end of the webinar, we won't be able to follow up with you. So if you would like for us to um, follow up with you with a response, if we're not able to get to your question, just make sure to use your name um, when you submit your question so that we can um, know who you are so that we can follow up with you. And we always love to know who you are. Um, so, so if you wanna leave your name, then it's, it's nice because it's nice to see some friendly faces and names. Um, we will be sending out today's deck and the recording of the webinar. Um, we're also gonna be sending out some new tools. So um, check your email um, in the next few days because there's gonna be some um, nice, I think nice um, tools available for you um, with this recording in addition to the recording and the deck. Um, we also have the live transcript enabled for this way, this webinar so that you'll be able to see um, the, the, the transcript of, of what, what we're talking about today. If you'd like to enable that, this feature, please turn it on using the setting on your Zoom toolbar and you can do that now. So looking at the folks who registered, it was so nice to see so many friends um, and so many um, customers that Andrea and I are so lucky to get to work with and, and others that we get to talk with. Um, but for those that are not familiar with Cindio, um, Cindio is the leading workplace analytics platform. Um, we work with all of these amazing organizations that you see below, um, below here today but we work with many, many more confidentially as well. So we work with more than 300 customers. Um, we've analyzed data for over 8 million employees. And I think what really differentiated, differentiates us, and I think that you're gonna see this um, from hearing from Andrea, who is um, just a wealth of information, is the fact that our, not only are we our technology platform, um, but we also have expert advice and support that span um, all of these areas around legal best practices and all of the custom analyses that we do and reporting and communications. Um, so really thrilled to be with you um, today. Um, Cindio has several different um, products that we'll, um, that we'll mention at the end of it, but one of the things that we're really excited to talk about today is our global pay reporting um, capabilities. So today I am so lucky to be joined um, by Andrea Palmiter. Andrea leads our team that's engaged in the workplace equity analyses. So she is has a wealth of, in, of expertise conducting robust analytics and advisory services to our customers in both pay equity, global pay reporting, and DE&I. Um, for those of you who have worked with Andrea, um, she just always gives such um, comfort because she is just such a pro at all of this. She's an expert in data management and in, work, in, in workforce analytics. Um, and she's led many of our Cindio customers through the process of um, pay equity compliance and pay equity reporting all around the globe. Um, my name is Christine Hendrickson. And I um, am the Vice President of Strategic Initiatives. I sit on Cindio's strategy team. Um, I am a lawyer by background, as I mentioned. I was a partner and I co-chaired the Global Pay Equity Group at Cypher Shaw before being lucky enough to join the Cindio team. And at Cindio, I, um, I work and lead on our global pay reporting um, capabilities along with Andrea. Andrea 
and Andrea and I both sit on our global pay reporting team. Um, so Andrea, I wanted to chat with you a little bit about what you're seeing on how employers are approaching global reporting. Um, I really find that there's kind of very different ways that in, that employers are, are coming to this. Um, and I think of it as almost like a maturity model in terms of where they are around, around that. Like some are still deeply in this very decentralized um, process. Other, others have moved all the way to a more coordinated um, appro approach. But I, Andrea, can you just talk us through like the three different um, approaches that you've seen and what you're seeing on the ground um, around how are how your customers are approaching global pay reporting. Absolutely. And we're seeing a shift right now um, as the legislation changes. Um, for a long time, a lot of companies that we worked with did this sort of decentralize. Their local teams would handle the, the local compliance needs for their area, for the jurisdiction that they're in. Um, and as there's more and more legislation passing, particularly in Europe, but in the US, elsewhere globally, um, there's more attention from company leadership. And so there's more pressure to sort of say, like, let's make sure we're complying with these laws because they're becoming more high profile. Um, so we're seeing a lot more of our customers start to sort of um, take on other strategies for this, whether it's, um, you know, outsourcing to someone else or more and more getting ownership in the total rewards yeah. team and saying, okay, this team needs to own this. Um, and it's being done by people who've never done it before and have to sort of learn all of these different special compliance needs in all of these different places. And so we're seeing that work start to sort of um, uh, condense with one team. And then they're sort of saying like, okay, how do we not just do the baseline compliance, but how do we build on this, use it as a lever for communication and for thinking about how we can improve as a company? Yeah. And, and is that coming because of what's going on with the EU directive? Is that kind of what's pushing folks or what are you, what are you seeing as what, the, why is the why now? <laughs> I think um, that's probably the biggest driver um, yeah. is that there's just more requirements. And mm -hmm. so suddenly this is on the radar of leadership in a way that it wasn't before and they want to make sure it's getting done. And public and so public. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, totally, totally. Um, for those on the call with us today, I would love for you to look at these three approaches and kind of think, where are you at this, at this on your global reporting journey? Are you at the phase of more decentralized compliance where you're doing it kind of regionally or locally with homegrown solutions? Um, do you have a do you have an integrated approach or are you starting down that road or where are you on on this on this approach? I would be really curious to see. Um, where people are standing. So if you wouldn't mind, I think a, a quiz probably just, or a little poll just pop, popped up into your um, <coughs> screens. If you wouldn't mind just telling us a little bit about where you are, um, it would be really interesting to us to understand what that what that looks like for your, for your organizations. So we'll give you a minute to do that. And it's totally fine to say that you don't know because a lot of this is is kind of figuring out what that what that looks like for your organization. Where do you want to be um, as you move as you move through this? That's something we hear consistently from our customers that we work with as well. You know, we we ask, you know, are you feeling comfortable at your global pay reports? And a lot of our the folks that we work with on total rewards teams will say, Oh, I actually don't know how we handle that. Right. Right, right. It's like it's so much a part of the the work that you do as on a total rewards on the total rewards team, but it may not be, um, you may not be handling it. Yeah, exactly. Okay, Michelle, do you think that we have do we have sufficient votes in, or should we give it another give it another minute? Okay, perfect. Um, okay, so a lot of non voters, we see you, but that's okay. This is great. We really appreciate all of those who voted. Um, this is this is what kind of what we would what we're hearing too that you're that the majority of people are starting to tell their story. So we have thirty six percent that are starting to tell their story. They want to get it. Um, they want to do this right. They want to be able to tell a consistent story. 
but they don't have all of the resources that they need to, to tackle that effectively. Um, the second highest was this decentralized compliance where it's handled at the regional level with homegrown solutions. Um, and then 22% of you, superstars, gold stars for you, um, have a more coordinated and sustainable approach um, around what that looks like. And then um, the, the very honest do not know. I think that I was expecting actually that to be higher because of what, what we're hearing, but, um, but there's 16% of folks just weren't exactly sure where they are. Um, one of the things that I think that really for, frankly, any of these buckets that we're finding is a pretty consistent number of pain points. Some of them are going to hit you harder um, if you are in a very decentralized um, approach still, but you'll see my shoulder keeps like going out of, out of, out of, out of view there. Sorry about that, guys. Um, but these are really the six common pain points pain points that we see pretty consistently. So the first one is, I don't even know where I have reporting obligations. Um, so it may be that they're like, I think that that's being handled at the local level, but I frankly don't even know where there are reporting obligations in all of our countries that we, that we work with around the globe, whether we meet those reporting obligations, um, whether we meet those thresholds, when, when we're getting close, um, could we go back just for one second? The second one is just the need to project manage all of these deadlines. The data, the requirements keep changing. How do we prepare the calculations and how do we address the gaps? So we're just going to take these one by one with both talking about what is the pain point that we're seeing, what, that we're hearing from our customers um, and from folks that we're, um, that we're in conversation with. Um, in roundtables and the like, and then how are we seeing people meet that point, pain point? Like, what are the what are some solutions around that? Because we don't want, although a pain party is there is a misery does love company, and it is nice to have to know that you're not alone in that. We also don't want you to leave this feeling in any way like you don't have solutions around all of the, these. So. so um, during our conversation, we're gonna talk about some new tools that Tindio is gonna be rolling out um, um, that will that will address all of these, all of these pain points that we're seeing. So we'll talk, we'll talk through through all of that. Okay, so the first one. The first one is I just don't even know where I have reporting obligations. Um, this is a this is a quote that we heard from one of the VP of Total Rewards. What are you hearing on this, Andrea? Like, what it, what do you hear when you hear hear this pain point? Um, I think it's because you know every country that has a new law, there's ones popping up in countries all the time, in states in the U.S. all the time, yeah. um, and then they all have different thresholds of how yeah. many people employees you need to have in that area. And so it's like, oh well, you know, um, in this country I have a hundred people. Does that mean I have to do the reporting or not? Um, right. And so being able to kind of track down those thresholds is a key piece as well. Yeah, totally. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. So all of the all of the quotes for each of these pain points came directly from. Um, from our customers or, or, or in round tables and the like. And this one is like, it's delegated to the regions. Honestly, I don't even know where we have reporting obligations. I'm just hoping local HR has this covered. Um, so there is this feeling of like, you know, kind of hoping that, that you're in compliance. But I think that as, especially as these become more and more public, as we're going to be talking about later on throughout this um, and the fines get larger and the, and the, um, and the microscope on these get get even more um, more um, pronounced. That this approach is is really difficult. Um, the reason why this is the case is kind of twofold. Um, the first the first reason that it's it people don't know is they don't know exactly where there are reporting obligations. So right now. There are 28 countries around the world that have reporting obligations. But as we see on this slide, the threshold, the number of employees that you have to have in each jurisdiction is really variable. So you may know where you have employees. You may or may not know if there are reporting obligations. But even if you know both of those things, you may not know if you meet the, um, the threshold um, for for reporting, um, as you can see here, 
we have a lot of variability. And even within that variability, it be becomes a little bit more complex. So right now we have Spain. If you have even a single employee in Spain, um, there is an obligation to maintain a wage registry. If you have more than 50 employees in Spain, then you have to develop an equality plan. In Sweden, the obligations kick in just at 10 employees, but then there's additional obligations to document the active measures that you're undertaking if you have more than 25 employees. Finland makes it slightly easier by saying just 30 employees, but Minnesota adds another layer of complexity. So it says it applies if you're a state contractor with the state of Minnesota and you have more than 40 full-time employees in Minnesota or in the state where, you're where you have a primary place of business for at least one day in the 12 months prior to executing the contract. So on and on, you can see that this gets like kind of increasingly complicated and it's also changes. So for example, in Ireland in 2020, um, in, prior, in prior years, the threshold was 250 or more employees. In 2024, it drops to 150 or more employees. And next year, that threshold will change to 50 or more employees. Um, and in some places, it's different based on the kinds of gap that you're seeing. So in Japan, for example, there are some obligations to do reporting if you have more than 101 employees, but the pay gap calculation requirements don't kick in unless you have 300 or more or one employees. And then Israel, they're not always intuitive standards. So for example, in Israel, the threshold is 518 employees. So a little, it feels like even if it were something that you were really on top of, um, and I know that our customers are just amazing um, at staying on top of all of these requirements, but it's really complex um, because it's not intuitive and it's certainly not the same from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. There's differences. Some of them require that you look at a company wide, others of them look at it legal entity by legal entity. So the complexity, it's like every time you click in, the complexity is more and more. Um, this is a pain point that we're hearing. This is probably the pain point that we hear, at least for folks that are kind of new to this space and are not at that kind of coordinated and centralized way, um, but are either kind of getting their arms around, where do we have reporting requirements? How do we want to approach this? And so we are just releasing, and this is this is kind of new new news, um, a brand new um, online pay reporting calculator, and this is free um, for everyone. You're going to get the link to it. You're going to be the first ones to get it. Um, we're going to send you a link to this at the um, after we send out the slide when we send out the slide deck to you and the re webinar recording. We're also going to send out the link to this um, pay equity reporting calculator. So for that, you can take each of the jurisdictions that have reporting obligations or will with the EU directive, indicate the number of employees that you that you have and will identify for you whether or not you meet the, the threshold um, reporting obligations in each of those individu individual jurisdictions. So we did want to provide you something um, to meet that first pain point because it's one that we that we hear you know pretty consistently um, that we need to understand what that what that level of complexity looks like. The the second pain point um, kind of aligns to the to the first one um, is I don't really even know how to project manage all of these very different and disparate deadlines. Um, so we heard from one of the, a manager at a global um, cloud communications platform who, who was a leader on the compensation space. And they said, we were asking them, you know, how do you want to prioritize um, the reporting that we're going to be doing with you and for you? And they said, we think we should prioritize based on the deadlines, but I'm actually not even sure when the deadlines are. Like, I'm not sure when the, um, the reports are due. For, for our various jurisdictions. Um, so for that pain point, we also wanted to provide something um, to solve that. And so one of the things that we've heard um, kind of loud and clear is this need to have a calendar around when are the, the various reporting 
um, deadlines. And so we put together um, both a calendar for the first half of the year and the second half of the year so that you can begin thinking through like, okay, when is when are when are our reporting deadlines coming and and what are those reporting deadlines? Um, the ones that are kind of most on the the most soonest on the horizon. Um, France is due on March 1st. Belgium is due next month. Um, the data in Brazil is going to be captured by the government in Brazil. We're going to talk a little bit about some changes that are coming in Brazil in a moment. Um, and then um, we have Austria. Some of these are, are biannual deadlines. Um, so some of them happen more than once a, once a year. And some of them happen every other year or every fourth year or every fifth year. Um, and so this is all of the, of the deadlines. There's also a fair number of jurisdictions that have rolling or employer specific deadlines. So for example, if you have reporting in Sweden, it may be that your reports are due, that you've historically done your reports at the end of the year. We have other customers that are doing their Sweden reports right now. Um, and so those ones are really going to be kind of specific to the jurisdiction. Other ones are set by the government, but are rolling like in Illinois. Um, and so we can definitely start. One of the things that if you fill out your information on that reporting calendar um, and you submit it for more information, we can provide you with, for each of your jurisdictions, this is when the, when the deadlines are due for each of your jurisdictions. And that can be really, really helpful um, to, to begin to get your arms around what those, what those reporting deadlines look like. Um, but we wanted to, we wanted to provide this as a, as a takeaway for you all. And then these are just the age two. Andrea, this is a huge one. This is one that we're hearing that I feel like loud, loud and clear around, around, I don't know how to project manage all of the deadlines. Absolutely, because there's there's a lot of moving parts to doing this work. Um, and so we see our, our customers kind of take those deadlines and build a work back plan for each of their jurisdictions where they have reporting requirements, starting with just figuring out like, when can I get started, which actually varies by jurisdiction based on the data snapshot you need. So to use one example, in the United Kingdom, um, reports are due in April, like Christine shared. Um, and you can use a one month snapshot from any of the previous 12 months. Um, which means, for example, for your 2025 reporting, you could use April 2024 data, which means that you could get started in May of this year for your report almost a year in advance. Um, in contrast, someplace like California here in the U.S., um, the, the data is for a full calendar year. And so for the May deadline this year, the earliest you could have gotten started was January because you needed all of 2023 data. So varies a little bit depending upon what that data snapshot is, how soon you can get started. Um, another piece we hear is from our customers is that often the data is kind of decentralized, that you know you need some things that live in your HRAS, some things that live in your payroll system. The information's kind of scattered, so we've got to figure out where this lives. And also that um, a lot of companies that we work with have um, different data systems in different countries. So being sure to track down that information for the particular um, country or jurisdiction that you're looking at is another piece that you'll need to factor into your timeline. Um, from there, you'll pull together your data. We'll get into the weeds a little bit more in the next few slides about what that process looks like. Um, but once you've pulled it all together, you'll want to do a couple checks to make sure it's compliant, finalize it, do all the calculations you need, um, and then get it into the format that you need um, to meet your requirements. Um, and then finally, you'll need to submit it, whether that's uploading it to a portal to submit it to the local government or to share it publicly as required in some jurisdictions. And so, Andrea, how are we working with, um, could we just go back for just a, a, a second on that last slide? Because I just had a couple of questions for you, Andrea. Mm -hmm. Like, what are, what are we doing with customers on this right now? It's like one of the things that we were hearing I think from customers is like, they wanted work back plans. Exactly. So what we're, um, go ahead. Yeah. What are we doing? No, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's totally fine. Um, so we're pulling together um, resources like the one you just shared on the, the previous couple slides of like, here's when um, 
the the due dates are for the the countries where you have reporting requirements based on that first you know where do you meet the thresholds um and then say like okay based on the sort of complexity let's figure out how we need to work back and and um get started on things so that we have sort of timelines and reminders of oh okay let's get um we can get started on uk let's get ahead of this um, and then our California is coming up and, you know, Japan, um, let's make sure we're keeping an eye on these and reminding ourselves as they're coming. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So I think that like one of the things that, um, we're rolling out internally with all of our, with our global pay reporting. So Cindio supports employers. Maybe I should say that Cindio mm -hmm. supports employers on, um, preparing all of the calculations in 29 different jurisdictions, um, there's a couple that like in the US where we have more than one jurisdiction. Um, and what we're, what I think that we're finding with that process is they wanted like a project plan that would identify here are all of the reporting that we're centralizing now. And this is the date that we should do everything that you just um, described and like putting together that actual project project plan. Um, and so as part of our Cindio Global Pay Reports, that is what we do is we provide you that, that work back, work back plan as you, as you articulated. Um, I love that point that you made, Andrea, around the fact that like you can get started quicker in some jurisdictions than others. Mm -hmm. um, and I just wanted to double click into that because I loved that point that, you know, with the UK, because your your base, it's you can pull the data effectively a full year, or almost a full year before the report is due. You can get started on that one so much sooner. Same thing in Ireland, where you're looking at you can get started six months um, six months in advance because you're pulling data in um, you're pulling data in June for a report that's due at the end of the year. So you can get started on that one in June. But I loved also the point that you're talking about in California is that we're often for California, the it's based on calendar year data. It's due in May, early May. Um, but it but often, and if this was the case this year, there's modifications that come from the from the state of California. And so you can't really begin until those that that uh the the new templates come out for that individual year. And then we we modify those. Um, and that doesn't happen until this year on February 1st. So you couldn't get started really until February 1st on that for a data due in, in May. So looking at not just what the deadlines are, but also what the reporting timeline is. And so that was one of the things that Andrea and I spent a lot of time doing is like going through every country that has reporting obligations and figuring out, okay, this one, it's due on this date, but the data is based on this time period. So when can we start? And then preparing that work back plan. And Andrea spent a lot of time working on that. Um, Andrea and I spent a lot of time working on, 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 put, on putting those resources together. So okay. for our Cindio Global Pay Reports customers, um, all of that is coming very, very soon to you all. Um, so we're really excited about it. I think it's gonna help a lot. And Christine, you made a, a point in there that I know we're going to get into a little bit later, but I think it's important to highlight is that these are constantly changing too. That, yeah. uh, you know, California, for example, largely the same as last year, but a few new statistics that they want to look at. And so it's important to say on top of, you know, we can't just replicate what we did last year. We have to um, keep an eye on anything that changes. Super important, super important. Um, well, why don't we get into a little bit on the next slide about um, how we pull together the data? Because this is something we hear consistently from the companies that we work with, that this is the hardest part. There's a lot of lift here. There's a lot of complexity to it. Um, we need to figure out what do I need to pull together specifically for each jurisdiction because they're all different. Um, and this is a something where the details really matter and you need yeah. to get it right. Rob, Rob um I hope I hope it's okay to call you out, Rob. But Rob um, Batcher wrote a, a note that he's like, I'd love to more understand more about the data process because um, the data the devil is definitely in the details in terms of in terms of the in terms of what that data looks like. Absolutely, and let's um, talk a little bit on the the next slide um, about what this guidance looks like. So, any given jurisdiction that has these requirements is going to provide really detailed guidance about. Um, 
what employees need to be included and which ones should be excluded, what types of compensation should be included and excluded. Um, and there's definitely a lot of documentation out there. If you were to go to a, the, the government website for whatever jurisdiction you're looking at. But it's um, often really, really challenging to find it because mm -hmm. it's in 10 different places and it's in um, many different languages. And there's some that like the UK provide really extensive amounts of documentation and others provide very scant amount of documentation. And so you're having to like cross-reference all of these different laws in terms of identifying, okay, what is considered to be compensation within this country um, and, and not. So agree totally, Andrea. Absolutely. Um, and you can see this example um, that's on the screen right now is from the UK, where, like Christine said, they have a ton of information and really detailed definitions of things. Um, and so uh, this is about, um, you know, what kind of pay do we need to include? Um, it, having sort of those definitions of, you know, what aspects of compensation count towards this ordinary base pay that we need for full-time relevant employees? What is a full-time relevant employee? All of those things matter. You need to make sure you're you're pulling those pieces in correctly. Um, and something that I think is important to note is I've never seen a customer get the data file right the first time. They always, you know, kind of go to their different databases, pull the pieces together, take a look at it and say, oh, I missed something or, oh, I included some people that are should actually be excluded. So it's important to leave yourself time to kind of do a couple iterations on your data file in order to make sure it's compliant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So as part of Cindio Global Pay Reports, you know, we provide, we're providing to everyone um, the kind of thresholds and, you know, where there are reporting obligations for our Global Pay Reports customers. We're also putting together, as we mentioned on the last um, pain point, that kind of work back plan. Uh, also for our all of our global pay reports customers that we're working with on preparing their files, um, one of the kind of key things that we're providing to them is for each jurisdiction, a, um, a, a um, data template that identifies with precision exactly the data that we need. Um, and, you know, that we've done a, um, we've we these are very much um, documents that that require you know a lot of gathering of of different data points and we try to as Rob's as Rob Batcher said it's cha the challenging to find and it's written by lawyers so we try to make it um, move through the th through that um, so that we can answer the question so that it, it it's understandable about exactly what's required and how and how you how you find that information great call out. Okay, so the, the, the next data point that we see is, I'm, um, is the fact that this is a, a kind of an increasingly growing area of complexity. So one of the things that Andrea and I were talking about is that not only are there the 28 jurisdictions that currently require global pay reporting of some, some sort or another, um, that number is going to increase to 43 jurisdictions um, once the EU directive is transposed. Um, and the EU directive is going to require modification to 13 countries' current requirements. And it will also require that we have um, new reporting in 14, 14 countries. And the EU directive takes a very, very broad definition of what is considered to be pay. So they include things like base pay, but also anything, any complementary or variable components of pay. So that includes things like things that are maybe more obvious, like bonuses um, and allowances, but it also includes things like benefits, um, which is not something um, that is often included in, in the um, pay reporting or the definition of re remuneration um, in many jurisdictions. They also say that there, we're going to see, my guess is, that as each of the EU directive, as the EU directive is transposed in, in local law in all 27 member states um, by June 2026, my guess is this is going to be an area where there's gonna be considerable difference jurisdiction to jurisdiction. 
And the reason I say that is that in the directive itself, it says that the concept of pay should include all components of remuneration under the law, under collective agreements or practice in each member state. So that suggests that it will be um, that it will be different from jurisdiction to jurisdiction because we find um, very clear di differences in terms of what is considered to be remuneration um, and included in the allowances um, in individual in individual jurisdictions. So what's required in in um, what's required in Sweden is quite different than what's required in Spain is quite different than what's required in the UK um, in terms of, of, of what that what that looks like. And we think that that complexity, unfortunately, is going to continue as we move into this area of the of the EU directive. Um, so this is one thing that I think that like when we were um, identifying that we wanted to develop Cindio Global Pay Reports, this was like a spot that we felt like we really needed to dig very deeply and provide a lot of guidance um, because we were finding that the, the complexity of what should be included, which employees should be included, which kinds of compensation should be included were really the difference between having a compliant report and a report that wasn't compliant. And so we provided all of those kind of details um, and in, so that we weren't just leaving it up to our customers to have to, you know, dig through all of the, all of the resources to figure out if they, if they're in compliance or not. The, the next area that we're seeing is that these um, requirements keep changing. Um, so that this is one of my favorite quotes. So um, uh, one of our, one of our favorite folks said that they said, we don't want to be experts in the reporting space. We want a team to support us who's thinking for us and helping guide us. We need to start doing this differently. Um, we were finding that um, keeping up with the changing requirements is truly a full-time job. It's definitely a full-time job for me um, and um, others on our team, more than a full-time job for our, for our global pay report team at Cindio um, to make sure that they're identifying what is on the horizon? What's changing? What's coming? Um, and how is it going? And we have a whole team of experts that are staying on top of, of what the reporting laws are. And that is our that is our space. Um, for for many of our, of our for most customer for most um, total rewards leaders, this is just a very tiny portion of their incredibly full plate. Um, I Nancy Romanishan, who sits on the strategy team. Um, at Cindio with me and who spent years and years at Willis Towers Watson before it was like when we were when we talk about global pay reporting she's like you know compliance definitely matters it's critically important to the total rewards leaders but it's definitely a very tiny tiny portion of their job and so to to add to your list of becoming a, an expert in global pay reporting and what do we mean by ordinary pay and what is this component of pay and that type of thing is, is just a lot. Um, so I hope that we can um, that we can help on that on that front as well. So how um, but on that front, we, we thought that we would talk a little bit about some of the changes that we're seeing um, because we wanted to make sure that they were on your horizon um, as things that are that are changing quickly. So I was just gonna go through each of these really quickly just to talk about what is going on. Okay, Brazil, we get so many questions about what's going on in Brazil. So in Brazil, Unlike many of the pay reporting obligations that you're going to be familiar with, like in the UK or in California or Sweden or Israel or Japan or many other places, um, the Ministry of Labor is going to assemble and publish the reports. So employers are not required to actually prepare their own um, pay gaps in Brazil. This is new news, um, in newish news. Um, in the original legislation, it was not at all clear whether or not that obligation would sit on the plate of employees or whether that obligation would sit on the plate of, of the Brazilian government. So when we received additional guidance um, and the regulations came out, it was clear that 
employers will be will be required to submit data to um, to the government in Brazil, but then the Ministry of Labor is going to calculate and prepare the reports. So let me talk a little bit about what data is required. There's two data sources that are going to feed into the reporting that is gonna happen in Brazil. Both of this da data sets for both of these is due this month, due in February. And then the Ministry of Labor in Brazil is going to calculate the reports um, for all employers that are subject to these obligations and will provide those reports next month in, in March. And then this will happen twice a year um, in Brazil as, as we showed on the, um, on the calendar. So there's two data sources that I mentioned. The first one is through the e-social platform. So employers in Brazil are already required to submit a lot of data, um, of HR data to the e-social platform in Brazil. And nothing will change about that. So everything that you've done in the past, if you're an employer that sits in Brazil um, or has employees in Brazil, that you're, if, you've, um, if you've submitted data through the e-social, same data, no new requirements. You just have to keep doing what you've been doing in the, back, in the, in the past. The second requirement is that there's a new tab, tab and it's called the Equal Pay and Remuneration Criteria. Mm -hmm. And it's added, it's now live, and it's added to the employer area of the Emprega Brazil portal. And that portion asks a series of questions about your hiring and your compensation practices, but you don't have to submit employee data. So all of the employee data that is getting submitted goes through eSocial, no changes, no additional requirements, and then you have to answer these questions. Those two things will be married together by the Ministry of Labor, and they will provide a report back to the employer um, on, the, on the website. That employer, then employers will need to ensure that that is um, published or shared um, either on their website or in, through other means with their employees, um, but you will not have to actually do the calculations. That said, the Ministry of Labor in Brazil can come back and ask more questions um, and identify gaps, and then you have 90 days to respond to that. So we're working with um, with our with our cut our global pay reports customers to kind of analyze their data because it's all under the CBO categories um, kind of and and often those aren't used um, regularly or for this purpose in Brazil and so we're doing a lot of analytics around understanding like what are those gaps going to look like so that when we um, hear back um, that we're one step ahead um, in the in in Brazil so that's what's new on the on the horizon in Brazil. What's new on the horizon in Australia is that we are just days away from a major change in Australia. So on February 27th, so just in a very, very soon next week, um, the WGIA, the Workplace Gender Equality Agency, is going to begin publishing the pay gaps of private, private sector employers um, that have more than 100 employees. There's also some changes to the, to the legislative landscape, some additional things that will have to be done um, with, the, with the kind of ongoing reporting. So we're gonna have to do things like provide information about um, you know, who, the pay of the CEO, the head of business, casual managers. We're gonna have to report on sexual harassment and harassment on the grounds of sex or gender discrimination. All of that is kind of new. And that will come with the first, this next reporting cycle in April. Um, and then they're gonna, um, and then WGI is gonna begin publishing the public sector gaps in late 2024 or early 2025. So we're seeing some kind of big things is Australia is soon to be public. And there's going to be with a new report that's due um, in April, there's going to be some additional um, kind of call out requirements that are coming with that. What's new on the horizon on France um, is that this is the fourth year of the general obligation to publish the pay equality index. Um, so la as of last year, all employees that didn't reach the 75 points out of 100 um, will be held liable for a financial pe penalty of up to 1% of payroll. There's some additional obligations that apply also to larger employers in France um, that are new on the horizon. 
with California, um, California is an interesting one. So California is fair, makes little tweaks every year. And this year they're really focused on whether on remote employees. So we've been talking about Cindio about, um, you know, looking at pay gaps around remote employees. And this is actually coming on the horizon um, with changes that we're seeing that we're seeing there. And then on the EU directive, I'll just hit this really quickly. Um, with the EU directive, I just wanted to, we just wanted to make sure that it was clear. This is not a modification to the EU directive. This was the case the whole time, but we're having more conversations with employers around what the reporting looks like on the EU directive. So if we want to just um, quickly hit the next slide. Yeah, perfect. So as we know, there's kind of two different requirements as part of the, um, the EU directive. So you're going to have to calculate overall gaps, overall means, overall medians, pay gaps in different components of pay. Um, and then you're going to have to do quartiles and participation gaps. The part that's on the left-hand side for folks that are familiar with the reporting in the UK or in Ireland, this looks really similar in many ways. There's some differences, but it looks quite similar to the reporting that's required there. But on the category of worker pay gap, um, we're also going to have to calculate gaps between workers that are, um, that are doing the same work or work of equal value. We just wanted to mention for you, and again, I'm not going to go through this um, in too much detail, but on the next slide, but but have you? But we wanted you to have it as a takeaway, is that these are treated very differently in the EU directive. So they're directed, they're different in how public they are. So for example, that overall pay gap has to get filed with the government. It's going to be published on government websites. It may be required to be published on company websites. That, but that category of worker gap has to be shared with employees and with works councils or employee representatives and with employee um, labor inspectors. And then there's also kind of big differences on how much action, oh geez, um, for some reason this got a, this got duplicated um, on this last version, but we'll add, we'll add that on the, on the final version um, that, that it, it shows that on the category of worker pay gap, um, if you have gaps of greater than 5% that you can't explain on the category of worker pay gap, then you'll actually have to make adjustments on that. So we'll share this out on the, um, with the, with the final, final slide deck. Andrea, how about this one? Yeah, um, uh, taking all of that great information that Christine just shared about keeping track of all the little details, then you have to actually do the report. Mm -hmm. So you want to make sure that you take the data you've compiled in alignment with all of those changing regulations and do your calculations um, and make sure that they're compliant. Um, and then as um, Christine was saying, sometimes this is um, you know, an upload to a, a government portal. Sometimes you have to share this publicly, share it to your employees, to your works councils. It depends with every jurisdiction what you actually do with the results. Um, a key thing to remember is that particularly if you're doing an upload, you, there's a lot of details to keep track of there too. Um, a lot of these need you to have things like your gender data coded in a particular way or your job descriptions in a particular way or else it'll reject your upload. So make sure you leave yourself some time there too to go back and do a correction to your file if for some reason it's not formatted the way you need to do your upload. And then once you've got it submitted, you're not necessarily done. A um, couple of key pieces to be thinking about is one, to Christine's point, particularly in the EU, but elsewhere as well, if you find gaps or issues that come up as part of this reporting analysis, um, you'll want to make an action plan to address those gaps. Um, be thinking about, you know, oh, if I have um, a gender pay gap, what am I going to do about it? Especially if that is something that you had to share publicly mm -hmm. or to your employees. Um, because even if there's no direct um, government consequences for it, your employees knowing that, the public knowing that, you'll be held accountable to doing that. Um, so we see a lot of our customers um, building out communications plans. I saw a question about this in the chat as well. Yeah, um, I love but, that. Sebastian yeah. had this great question. He said, you know, how do you suggest companies balance reporting different metrics as required by the different jurisdictions, but also having a common narrative? That's like something that we're, um, that we're working with with several of our customers around, like looking at what that looks like um, for them. Yeah. 
Absolutely. Um, and, and we see different approaches. Some do it sort of jurisdiction by jurisdiction that for every, um, publicly um, reported report that they put out, they'll do it in kind of a nice several page report with data visualizations and some narrative around, you know, why do we see this being the issue that we're having? Um, what are our goals? Who do we want to be as a company? And what are the actions we're taking to fix it? And I think that that's a really key piece is being able to share that action plan. So in addition to those kind of leveraging these um, public reporting requirements as an opportunity to tell your story, um, we also see customers is doing something more centralized and saying, let's look at the trends we're seeing across our different locations across the globe and say, these are the things we need to focus on. Let's let's talk more holistically, um, both internally and figure out what work we need to be doing, and as well as um, how do we want to be talking about this to be thinking about our employer brand, our public perception. How do we make sure that people see us as a, a workplace that cares about fairness? Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I love that, like that quote, like around the fact that it's, you know, it's like a sales brochure. Your, mm -hmm. your global pay reports are almost like a sales brochure because they are, they are so public. Um, so yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I think that we just wanted to just line it up really clearly around like, what are your, what are the pain points that we're seeing and like, what are the solutions looking at, looking like, um, we will be providing out that global um, reporting calculator so that you can identify at least where you have reporting obligations. Um, for our global pay report customers, um, we will help you develop a project plan for all of the jurisdictions where you have reporting requirements um, to help you um, so that we can align to, to both when the data pool looks like and then what, the, what it goes, um, goes along with, as, as Andrea mentioned. Um, we also will help you with the data to prepare the reports, keep you up to date on the changing requirements, and help you prepare both the ca calculations to ensure compliance. Um, the addressing gaps or communicating results, you can't do in a silo. You really need to be looking at your workforce really holistically. So looking at what are your overall pay gaps after you take into account your controls? So using the pay EQ platform for that, but also looking at what is our representation like? What is the promotion like? Where are we seeing gaps there? So it's really Cindio's full workplace equi equity platform on that. So you need to look at both our equal pay for equal work and equal access to opportunities in order to, um, to put together a narrative to address those gaps and then also to be able to communicate about, uh, communicate about those results. Um, so yeah, we have solutions on all of, all of those that we'll be sharing as, as I as I mentioned um, around um, you know managing those reports, ensuring equal pay for equal work, tracking representation, figuring out what we have what we're doing in terms of um, performance management that may be contributing to the pay gaps that we're seeing, and then once you have it, then you really want to maintain it. So with using PayFinder, so that you can continue. Um, to track progress and explain those those individual pay decisions, um, and so the the part on global pay reports just as a like a last kind of double click into this, we support twenty nine jurisdictions in the U S. Um, the UK around the globe, we talked about the fact that there are some jurisdictions um, or some countries that have more than one um, reporting obligation. So we support um, across the globe on that. And for that, we provide three different deliverables. Um, we provide the um, instructions and guide that is your roadmap to identify kind of what that looks like. We provide that data template and then the, the final report that has those key metrics and model narratives and communication advice. So all of that comes with the Cindio Global Pay Reports. Um, well, we have some awesome questions, Andrea. Do we, can we take a couple quick hits on on the on the questions, um, one of them was interesting around like, what do we see um, in terms of um, employees that are remote and the fact that they're that we have people that are reporting into a jurisdiction maybe part a part of the year and reporting into another country. Um, definitely one of the nuances that we talk about in the, both the data template and in the instructions and guide. Um, in many jurisdictions, they provide um, explicit um, guidance in terms of how do we handle 
um, remote employees? How do we handle expat employees? But there's no one size fits all. Different jurisdictions handle that quite differently from one another. Um, and that's one of the things that we that we look at. Um, I think one of the key themes here with um, with all of this work is there's a lot of it depends. Um, right. you know, jurisdiction, you want. Yeah. jurisdiction, you want to make sure you're keeping on top of that because it really does differ from depending upon where you're looking. Yeah, that's a great that's a great point. Um, there was there was also questions on um, pay reporting resources in the United Arab Emirates. Um, in the UAE, there is a labor law that says that you have to be granted an equal wage um, <clears throat> to men, to male and female workers, um, but not on the reporting, not as much on the reporting side, but happy to follow up with more, with more guidance on, on that individual question. Um, they, there was another question around if we have decentralized business model with many multiple legal entities in the country, do we roll them up or do we not? And again, as Andrea just said, this is one of those, it depends. Um, so even in California, it depends. So in California, you can choose to, um, you know, generally you're reporting legal entity by legal entity, but in some circumstances you can roll together. In other in other jurisdictions, you're actually required to roll them together. And in other jurisdictions, you're required not to roll them together. And some provide um, the, the flexibility to do that one way or the other. Um, so there's differences on that one. And another thing to keep in mind with that is that if you um, is that the reporting thresholds count differently in different countries with relation yeah. to that. So if you have 500 yeah. employees in a country and think, oh, well, I'm above the threshold here, but it turns out it's split across four entities that maybe some of those entities you need to report on, some don't, maybe none of them hit the threshold. Um, yeah. Whereas other places, it's just how many total employees do you have? Yeah. And then in places like California, it's like, how many employees do you have if you're at a hundred or more? But then if you even have a single employee in California, you have to report. And so it it's... It's nuanced in that way as well. Great question though, great question. Um, yeah, then there's last one. Are we able to also support pay equity analysis for a country where there's not yet a legal requirement? That's a great question. So yeah, I, I can speak a little bit to that. Yeah. Um, that's something that a lot of our customers come to us with um, looking at um, doing um, analytics on pay equity is sort of our, our bread and butter um, and, and workplace equity more generally, um, helping to think about just what are within that country, how are you looking? And then globally looking at trends across your different countries, um, making sure that we're paying people fairly, that you're seeing people sure. moving through your organization with promotions and hiring and, and that kind of thing, performance ratings. Um, that's all things that we support our customers with. Yeah, that's a great, that's a great call out. Like right now, New Zealand doesn't have a global pay reporting requirement. That said, we do a lot of pay equity analyses in New Zealand, um, where we have employees in New Zealand. And that's true in many other, you know, Netherlands is part of the EU. It will have requirements. Um, <clears throat> it doesn't currently have reporting requirements, but we're doing a lot of pay equity analyses, even in those jurisdictions. Good call. And even much of the United States, uh, we have pay equity laws, but we don't have reporting requirements for most. Yeah, states. good call out. Good mm -hmm. call. Good call. Well, we wanted to be um, mindful and respectful of your time. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, and we look forward to um, we look forward to connecting with you more. And um, if you would want to hear more, definitely reach out to us and we'll be sending out all of the individual um, guidance as we're going for um, going forward. So looking forward to connecting with you all soon.